So Omega have finally released their novelties for 2022. Well, what do I think of them? Well, let's find out. I'm Andy and welcome to the English Watch. Now this channel is about me and my watch collecting journey, an amateur enthusiast with an eye for detail, helping like-minded individuals like you start your watch collecting journey. Now, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Please also check out any of the links below, it really helps the channel grow, really appreciate it. Now, if you really like this video, you can always buy me a coffee at the buy me a coffee link in the description. Now, before we get into the content that I'm gonna talk about today, I did try watching uh, Paul Thorpe and his mate um, David on with the, on with the Tash uh, last night, Tuesday. Uh, and they did a, a live stream on their views of the Omega uh, releases. And as diehard Rolex and AP fans, you can only guess how it went. Now they gave their honest opinion and their opinion is as valid as mine. But I have to say, watching it, and I couldn't watch more than 20 minutes, half an hour. It was a bit like presenting my then five or six year old child with a plate of broccoli. He knows it's good for him, but he just doesn't like it, and there's no getting around it. And you could just, you could just hear the, oh, yeah, oh, not at that price. Oh, what are they thinking? Oh, Rolex. Oh, anyway, everyone's entitled to their opinion. It was good entertainment. Uh, there's other channels you can watch. You can watch this one. I really appreciate it too. And if you stay to the end, I'll tell you my favourites from the range and which ones could ascend to my famous mood board that uh, check out my last video to look at my my mood board uh, of how I've been trying to gauge my opinion and gather some thoughts around which watches should make it into my collection. Now to celebrate what I thought was going to be new Amiga Planet Ocean Day and in fact it was I guess in a way I've been wearing my famous Planet Ocean. So this is the blue dial on this wonderful blue Omega rubber strap now I highly recommend anyone that gets a Planet Ocean, and I do recommend the Planet Ocean, get a rubber strap, but get a genuine rubber strap. And don't cheap out on those cheap eBay clasps. This is jewelry and it's really nice. Anyway, let's start with the review. So the first on the list is the Speedmaster, the first and only Speedmaster. Not second best, as I was listening to last night. The Speedmaster is the chronograph. What we have is some more precious metal uh, Speedmasters. So obviously the Speedmasters were placed last year, uh, first Speedy Tuesday of 2021, uh, with the new uh, variant with the 3861 Master Chronometer Coaxial Movement. That's what's in this one. All they've done is they've added a splash of colour using gold. And in this instance they've used Moonshine Gold, first seen on the 50th anniversary, the one with the red ceramic bezel. I really like um, and they've added some other flourishes so yes we've got green and green will become a little bit of a hot topic throughout all of this as, as I'm sure you know um, but we've also got one with uh, it's almost like a dark grey charcoal charcoal grey with a gold dial now I really like that one um, the rubber strap version I think looks really nice. Um, I've never tried an all gold watch on so I don't know how it would wear on me. I can't afford it anyway but um, I think that's probably a bit too much. But having said that, these watches are not for, I say you and I, these are for die hard enthusiasts um, because you won't find them in a shop window. You know, these are special boutique only uh, and probably a limited number of boutiques you can get them from. Um, green's obviously popular colour. The green looks nice with the gold. Uh, I think they're very sort of earthy colours that, that go well together. But the contrasting um, sort of panda dial black sub-registers on the gold dial, I think, looks pretty smart. Pretty smart. Uh, parallels to Daytoners, you can draw them all day, can't you? But at the end of the day, are there colour combinations that go well together? Yeah, of course there are. And I think Omega have executed that quite nicely. So, top marks, like them. Right, moving on to the Planet Ocean. Now, the Planet Ocean, uh, as we know, was originally released in 2005, seen on Daniel Craig's Bond in 2006. I think it was later updated in 2012-ish. 
uh, with the 8500 and then again in 2016 with the current version that I have with the 8900 movement. Now we were expecting another iteration of the regular Planet Ocean but no, we got something probably better. So Omega have given us the Ultra Deep which is in effect a much more hardcore dive watch than the Planet Ocean which is already a, a hardcore dive watch. But in the Ultra Deep what we've got is something that has um, a direct link to you know, the Ultra Deep from 2019 and I forget the depth it went down to, forgive me for not looking that up, but these are now 6,000 metre dive watches which is utterly ridiculous but that's not the point is it, you know, it's like buying a, a new Land Rover Defender that can climb up mountains and go over rocks and all sorts of stuff but all we're going to do is mount the curb outside the local school. It's not about what you're going to do with it, it's about what it can do. It's all about the promise, isn't it? But what Omega have done, unlike Rolex with its uh, sea dwellers and its um, deep seas, they've not just created a, a Russian doll effect where the next one's bigger than the next one. They've made something quite stylish. They've made it different to the planet ocean. It still looks like a planet ocean, and I think the, the accents and the design styles that they've picked out are key to its design aesthetic. So the sort of tapered markers, the aberrant numerals, yes, there's no date on this one, and that works quite nicely. Um, but the minute and hour hands, the second sound, everything works the same, even the, the dashed element around the outside of the bezel and the way it's designed. So I think these are really nice. Now I think there are some design features on this one that could copy forward to a future uh, Planet Ocean upgrade. Colours notwithstanding, but where you've got a crown guard now on the steel versions, I can see that creeping into the Planet Ocean at some point. Now the absence of a helium escape valve, I still see that being a staple for the 300 and the regular Planet Ocean. Uh, the only reason these new watches, the Ultra Deeps, don't have them is due to the way that the crystal and the case and the case back are all designed to be so airtight uh, that the helium escape isn't an issue. Um, so they've done something clever with the liquid metal, there's some patents involved, the way that the crystal is pushed into the case, the way that the case back is screwed back on, all really high tech stuff. Don't ask me to explain it. There's probably a good video somewhere to go and watch that. So, I love them. So I like the um, I like the orange one. I think it looks pretty smart. I like the chocolatey gradient dial. Uh, the regular Planet Ocean with the orange and the white dial, a little bit too bit too funky for me. Uh, but I think this combo is pretty cool. And I also like the controversial one, the James Cameron with the blue and the black. Now, funnily enough, the oceans are blue. And the deeper you go, the blacker it gets. So, yeah, you know, there's only so much you can do with that thought. Uh, where Rolex have gone for the vertical gradient, they've gone for a radial uh, gradient. I think the radial gradient looks much better. So, yeah, I like that. And I like the fact that um, you get them on steel and rubber. Now, I do like the titanium version. I like it a lot. I think some of the blue accents could make themselves present in a later edition of the regular Planet Ocean. I do like the blue numerals and I do like the blue second sand but I don't like the NATO. I think the whole Manta uh, style lugs is pretty cool, very reminiscent of the new Tudor FXD but um, the fact this is a NATO only watch that's a deal breaker for me. I guess th th this is a real hardcore watch that one um, so it's going to be enthusiasts only but um, if you like a NATO I'm sure that watch is very wearable. Titanium will make it a bit lighter as well. But yeah, I like the steels. Now, the one thing that does amuse me, and uh, obviously the Omega marketing machine have been at it with the naming of their new steel. It's called Omega. So, Mega Steel. O dash Mega. Now, if you're like me and you say Omega, that works. If, however, you're like Mr. Bond and he says Omega, you have something called Mega Steel. Now, is the steel just Mega or is it Mega? Tomato, tomato. Anyway, it's a play on words that maybe hasn't quite worked. It doesn't really matter. They've invented or developed a steel that's purer, that has a crystalline structure, I guess, that doesn't allow the gases to transfer through the case. Yeah, there's some fantastic engineering in this watch and it justifies its price. 
you know it's not just something that looks good it's something that works as it should work something very capable and why shouldn't it be priced at that level now the one good thing about having the ultra deep it means that my planet ocean is still relevant it's still for me um looks current not that, that should matter that much but I, I like the fact that it wasn't replaced um and I also like the fact that even if it does get replaced at some point it will still look like a planet ocean omega have a, a, a track record not recently of, of developing watches a bit like um nissan and toyota where the yaris or the i'm trying to think of a yeah, corolla whatever it is the previous one looks nothing like the next one whereas BMW, Porsche, Audi tend to have more gradual evolution. So Omega is starting to do that and that's good. So going from one to the next, you do see a difference. There's always a performance uplift, but you don't lose the connection. And I like that. Moving on, we have more controversy with the Aquaterra. Now, a quick slurp of freshly brewed coffee. Hmm. A blue mug. Let's go with my blue watch. I do like blue things. Anyway, the Aquaterra. So they've released a range of new colors for the smaller versions, so 38 and 34 millimeter versions. Now, I quite like these. Now, yes, Rolex recently did release a load of uh, Oyster Perpetuals in very bright, sort of primary colors. But prior to that, they had uh, more subtle pastel-y colors with the red grape and some of the other ones, uh, the blue. Yeah, they've got some traditional colours that, that's still there. But yeah, you, there's no there's no denying it that Rolex had a great deal of success invigorating their. Well, actually, they've invigorated their cases because they're not there, are they? But but their range with some colour. I like these. Now they're not too in your face. Now although I like the 38 mil ones and I do like the red, I don't know the 38 millimeter watch. I don't know how that would wear for me now. Uh, 36 is too small. 38 maybe. Now I've tried the 38mm old Aquaterra and I just, it just felt too small but you know, never say never but if I did I would be homing straight in on that red one. Now the only thing I don't like about the 38 and this has been said before is the date window uh, where there's just a very sheer window with the white uh, date disc. I think that's a little bit too um, obvious but you'd have to say that the way we look at these is in rendered images, zoomed in, doesn't look right. Stick it on your wrist and then shove it a half a meter away from your face. Maybe it looks fine. So I kind of like the 34 mil. I think they're really nice. Uh, the, the colors are great. and I like the integration of the round portal style um, window. So I guess like, like a porthole on a boat. Uh, I guess it's trying to mix. It's got a nice little sort of silvery chromed um, ring round it as well. So that's quite nicely finished. 5,000 quid for a stylish ladies dress watch with an automatic movement. What's not to like? So the Aquatera, I, I think what they've done is quite nice. Now in the gent sizes at the 41 millimeter, again, the colors, you know, there's sort of dark blues, dark greens. They do have some high contrast ones with the white dial. And there's like the gray dial with the, with the laser blue uh, markers. And they're a bit funky, but I think these these were needed. I think when you look at the display cabinets in your average Omega AD or the boutique, the colours are very subdued, and I think adding a bit of a splash of colour is yeah just what we need. Now, if you look back at some of the old Omegas from the 60s and 70s, there were some really funky dials out there: blue, green, yeah, sunburst, contrast, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So, this isn't like Omega copying Rolex. This is Omega doing stuff that it's done previously. And maybe the timing is is out in terms of it looks like a follow lead um, situation, but ultimately that's what trends do, isn't it? Trends are things to follow, certainly for mass-produced goods where you want success because that's what people want. They've seen colourful uh, items in shop window or on, online. They can't get them. So what do you do? Well, you make your own, you make your own, but you do it in your own way. And that's the thing about Omega, they do these things in their own way, because they know the details matter. And it's not just about throwing color in there, it's about throwing the right colors. And what they've done with these is they've, again, using the old marketing machine, gone back to the Aquaterra element, so earth and water. And you have to say they're very earthy, very Grand Seiko-esque, you could argue as well. 
but that's all they've done as well. You know, they you know, certainly the seasons versions of the uh, Grand Seikos. So it's called Stealing with Pride. Uh, but you know, there's only so many colours out there, isn't there? And having worked for a car company before, and the, the time that goes into choosing the exact right shades of colours for the time and to create a, a level of longevity is really difficult to do. Um, when you look at these things, oh yeah, they look really nice, but there was probably a, a mood board of their own with lots of other colours on that were, ooh, ooh, yeah, don't know. But So it's easy to knock and say they're following Rolex, but you go into a high street in a few months' time and you'll see all these and you can be able to go and pick one out, try it on your wrist and walk home with it the same day. Yeah? That's what you need to do. Right. Let's move on to the controversial watch in the collection, that green Diver 300. I've never been a big fan of the Diver 300, as you know. I think the, um, the Planet Ocean has the right lineage. It's got the, those wedge-shaped markers, the broad arrow hands. The Diver 300 was a little bit of a, a 90s throwback. It was the right watch for the right time, but I think with the round indices, that weird scallop bezel, it's never never appealed to me. So adding a green version of it is no great shakes. Um, did the world need a green version? Well, there's a black and there's a blue and there's a white. They could have done a red, they could have done an orange. In fact, there's probably room for some sort of orangey kind of you know, mix like they've done with the Planet Ocean because then it would link in. Green? I don't know. Am I going to go down a, are they copied Rolex, it's a Hulk in disguise? No. I think green is a colour of the moment, not just because others have done it and others have been successful with it, but I think people are more, I'm going to go down the environmental road and say that people like green, yeah, they like um, sustainable things, they like uh, the green energy, environment, so green is a great colour to wear, and also people like green. I mean, blue's my favourite colour, but maybe green's your favourite colour. You think, well, there's not enough green watches out there. What well, do you know? What? Now there is. Now let's look at the Speedmaster 57. Now a watch that was, uh, I guess, released uh, ooh, 2014 or something like that. Um, it looked the same. It was the two register. It had the 9,000 um, column wheel coaxial movement so it's a great movement uh, and that movement you can see in lots of other watches uh, but it was too thick for this watch it looks like the original CK2915 it had the that sort of Fotina look um, although it had the two registers and the date I did like the aesthetics of that watch but having tried it on a few times it was just too damn thick um, with the automatic rotor winding the open case back too much too much watch and as it was trying to have a vintage aesthetic, having something that thick didn't work for me. So what I did in one of my videos not too long ago, and I predicted that Omega would take that new manual wide movement that was in the chronoscope recently released, and they've made it into the new 57. And I have to say, they've done a really good job. Now the old 57 range had some two-tone, it had some weird sort of strap and yeah, sort of colour combinations and I think what they've done with this one and what they've done with the 300 the uh, time only 300 they've got a blue one and a black one with these limited colours very specific about what the aesthetic is and it's very much harking back to a slimmer traditional style yes it's got a very bang up to date movement it's got a column wheel as I said it's a coaxial master chronometer and it's in that traditional 1957 CK2915 case. And I like that case. So if you've got other Speedmasters and you've got the, I guess the from the professional range 68 onwards with the twisted lugs, this one or something like First Omega in Space fits in the collection nicely because it's a different type of Speedmaster. And this is from 1957, don't forget as well. So anyone that's sort of complaining about Daytoners and Omega copy them, this one's been around a long time, a long time. Now what is odd that it's the 65th anniversary. Now Omega for some reason like 5th anniversaries. I mean the Snoopy, uh, the second silver Snoopy was the 35th I think, or the 45th, can't remember. 
and there was a 35 Apollo. I get all the all the, <laughs> all the numbers wrong now, aren't I? Apollo 15, which was the gold accented one, and you had a Fortnite uh, 45th anniversary Apollo missions. There's all sorts of fifth anniversary. So anyway, this is the 65th. What are we going to get in the 70th? Well, let's wait five years and see. But you know, five years is not a bad period to wait. But if there's one thing Omega are good at doing, and that's putting special edition Speedmasters out. But in this instance, they're not specials, they're the range. And I think the blue, the red and the green look fantastic. They've got the applied markers, the applied logo, that sunray um, dial. And I think the colours are just understated enough to have legs, so they're not they're not too um, fashion led. And all, you'd almost say that the red one is well, very reminiscent of the old Speedmaster versions from the 2000s. And I like that. Now I do like the black one with the Fotina. That's got a sandwich dial, so the um, the luminous material sits in not in a pocket but underneath is a separate sub dial. So the dial on top has a cutout, and then the the luminous material sits under it. Now that's got a printed uh, logo, but that's got its own party trick with the with the, with the um, sandwich. But the other ones I think look really classy. So with the sunray dials, applied markers, applied logo. And if you add that flat link bracelet from the original Speedmaster, well, it's quite a package, isn't it? And with a um, length adjuster as well on the bracelet. So nice. I really like those. Very, very nice. Well done, Omega. Well done. That hat's off. Right, so where does that leave us? So Constellation 41. Well, that's just another colour of a watch I don't really like. Um, there's a market for those, so let's not go there. Constellation 29 and 28. Now again, looking for, um, if you're looking for a quartz watch for your good lady, um, for around the £2,000 mark, there's a lot to be had from these constellations. And again, if you look in the AD windows now, there's blacks, there's silvers, there's whites. They're a bit boring. Now what we've got is a bit of a bit of spice. So again, my wife looks over my shoulder and goes, ooh, they're nice. Again, well done, Omega. About bloody time, if you ask me. So yeah, it's a nice little combination there. So I know what you're saying. What is my favourite? My favourite would be the red Speedmaster 57. And I do like the blue, black, um, radial gradient Planet Ocean. I think they could make it to the mood board. Not necessarily into the collection, although the Speedmaster is pretty good price, it's £7,000. Now, unlike um, Mr Thorpe, my decision to buy an Amiga is not based on how much discount I can get. My decision is based on whether I want the watch or not. Does it fit the look I'm going for? Do I like it? Yes, right. Is there a deal to be had somewhere? Maybe. If I don't get a few hundred quid off it, thousand quid off it, am I going to walk away? Well, no, uh, because that's the watch I want. Now, we're living in a world now where you can't buy a Rolex. You can't. So why should Omega discount their watches just because that used to be a thing? Now, if you can get a discount, great. If you can't, you know, take it or leave it. You know, when you when you sub ten thousand pounds, you know these are reward watches. Uh, some people have saved a lot of money over time to buy them for a special occasion. Why would you want to get rid of it yeah, unless you desperately needed the money? But yeah, I think most people buy these watches because they like them. In fact, they love them. They're not buying them because there's some level of value retention in there. I mean, if that was the case, I'd never buy another car. You know, crikey. I mean, it's nice being taken from A to B in, in comfort, but the thought of losing tens of thousands of pounds every few years is just heartbreaking, isn't it? But that's, that's life. So, um, oh, and this watch here, you know, I got, what, 10, 15%? I can't remember now. Um, four years old this year. Uh, I bought it for 4,000 quid, it's worth about 4,000 quid now. If I'd have tried to sell it within 12 months of buying it, I'd have lost money. But I don't want to sell it, so I've not lost anything. Buy and enjoy, that is the key to success. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I 
on reflection, I thought initially I was a little bit, but I think that's always the case, which is why I like to make these videos a few days later. So I've got time to think and ruminate on exactly my thoughts. And obviously you can't be actually having them in your hands and kicking the tires. But I think now, a few days later, I'm quite pleased. Nothing drastic, and I think if you're a brand that's making drastic changes every year anyway, then there's something wrong with your product line, there's something wrong with your brand. Slow evolution, add colours, tweaks, you know, homing on what is your model lineup, and I think Omega are pretty good now. They've got that nailed. Obviously Rolex have had it nailed for years, but you know, what are they going to give us this year? Different coloured Submariner? Whoopee. Anyway, I'm Andy. This has been the English Watch. Take care and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.